Okay, Isaiah chapter 11. In the Old Testament, you have what you would call covenants. You have the Adamic covenant with Adam and God. God made a covenant with Adam that he would kick them out of the garden, but he wouldn't destroy them. You have the Noahic covenant with Noah that he would never flood the earth again. The Abrahamic covenant, uh, the stars would be his ancestries um, by faith. Um, then you have the Davidic covenant, David. And David is the covenant where God will bring in the kingdom through David himself and the, the Messiah would come through David. And so we see those events taking place in these chapters here. And each of those covenants means something and they're important at that time. The Davidic covenant is, is still going on today in that Jesus Christ fulfilled that and that he was the son of David. You know, he is the son of God and that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords and he sits on the throne. And as David said himself, that he was his king and his Lord. Now, there are future events that we will be talking about. We'll be talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. We'll be talking about the millennium reign. Uh, future events, I made a little quick outline that uh, is available, and maybe I'll have them out Sunday or maybe next week here, on all the events that will take place right before the rapture and then after the rapture, three and a half years, and then three and a half years of, of all the troubles and things that will be taking place, the Armageddon, the second coming, all those things. And it's kind of, it's not in a chronological order, so don't take it as the gospel. It's not dogmatic, but all the events are in this, these columns, even during the millennium reign. And so when the rapture happens, that is that we will be caught out in the air, uh, Jesus will rapture us up, and then... Uh, the tribulation will begin. Where's the church at that time? When you go to Revelation, Revelation breaks up the whole book for you. And, and I believe that it's chapter, um, let me give you a, a chapter real quick. When you look at chapter, <clears throat> from see from chapter one are the things that John saw. When you see the outline in chapter 1, verse 19, I write these things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after. So the things that he's seen are all in chapter 1. So he gives you the outline for the whole chapter. So chapter 1 are the things that John saw. And then when you come to the things which are, those are chapters 2 and 3. And then you come to chapter 4, and these are the things that will take place. And in chapter 4... Through 22, we see those things that have taken place all the way after the rapture has taken place. We see the worship in heaven in verses 4 and 5. Uh, the rapture takes place somewhere around verse 1 of chapter 4. Everything else after that is taking place during the tribulation period, whether it's in heaven or whether it's on earth. But it's all taking place during the tribulation period and then the second coming in the millennium reign. So we'll talk about those things. Now, he starts in chapter 11 here. Uh, with a stem which sprouts forth from a dead stump, the stump of Jesse. And so in verse 1, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Jesse was the father of David. You don't hear a lot about him. You hear more about his son, David. But Jesse was a humble man, had sons, and David was chosen from his sons. And out of Jesse will sprout route forth a branch. Now, when you go back to chapter 10, you remember in verses 33, 34, the Lord had chopped down the pride of these enemies of Israel. And now he's looking at these stumps and he's saying, out of these stumps, there's going to rise a branch out of that root. Now, who is the branch? And it's talking about the Davidic covenant. It's talking about Jesus Christ. The Lord is looking at that stump and saying, out of it will grow one who will be the king and rule for eternity, the branch of Jesus Christ. So the stem of Jesse is of the Davidic line, the line of Christ, which will come forth from David. Then he says, concerning this branch or this root, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the word might there might mean heroic actions. And when you think of Jesus, there were a lot of heroic actions that he performed, not necessarily his strength and his might, but just who he is as a hero, 
And he should be your hero, right? He's our hero. Uh, he's the one that we should look up to, uh, not to man, but to Jesus Christ. Uh, he died on the cross for us. I mean, what man would do something like that for his enemies? You know, only Jesus would do something like that for us. He paved the way so that we could have eternal life. He's definitely a heroic action figure. Not a figure, but a fact. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So this branch that comes apparently from this dead stump is not barely alive, but it's literally filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Now we know that, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. So it's not that Jesus needed to be filled, okay? Because He and the Father and the Spirit are one, yet they're separate. So how does this all work? I don't really know, but He had the full Spirit of God in Him. And of course, as you see, what Jesus has done while well, he walked among us, you obviously know that he did. He could tell uh, what people were doing. That Daniel was sitting under the tree, and he said, I saw you sitting under the olive tree. You know, and boy, he believed after that when he told them where, where he was at and so forth. Jesus, uh, you know, speaking to Lazarus in the tomb. Lazarus, come out, and boom, just saying his name, he comes out. He was definitely a man filled with the Spirit of God in every aspect, in every aspect. Now, the perfect character of the Messiah, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. In the fear of the Lord. Jesus, uh, on many occasions, would say, I do everything that the Father asks me to do. Now, how many of us could say that? We can't. But he can. And that's why he's our hero. Because he's the one that has been obedient even unto the cross. And so it's not our works. Otherwise, that is what? Religion. But it's his works. That's relationship. And we depend upon the work of God. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, John 4, 34. And he finished it. And the work is still being finished. In fact, he has said in our lives that he has done a good work and he's faithful to complete that work. He's the author and finisher of our faith, right? And so that work is still being worked on, but he's going to finish it. And we're going to see that in the end when God finally uh, judges uh, Satan the Antichrist, a false prophet, and he casts them into the pit of outer darkness, and we will rule and reign with him for eternity. And he shall judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equality or equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his Lips, he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Now, the word wicked can also be written wicked one, and that is a reference to the Antichrist, where he says he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked one. And so Christ has power over the Antichrist who will be filled by Satan himself as a pawn to do his work. Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 says, Then the lawless one, or the wicked one, will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. And so we see that God's righteousness will prevail over the evil one or the wicked one as Isaiah writes it here with just the breath of his mouth that's how powerful our God is you have to remember Satan is a created being he has no power over God whatsoever and God only allows him to do what he does by God's permission and only to a certain point point. and God is so loving and so caring for us that he would not allow Satan to destroy us that's why he didn't allow Satan to destroy Job right Satan could have destroyed Job, but God says, no, I won't allow you to do that. You can't destroy him, but harm his body, and he'll still praise me. Because it's not about religion, it is about relationship, right? It's about relationship. Job could have said, this doesn't work. Here I call out to you, God, and I'm still having boils. I'm still losing my family. I'm, I'm suffering. Religion, this, this relationship that you call between us doesn't work, and so I'm leaving it. I'm going to go offer up some idols. I'm going to go worship another God, you know, because this isn't working. That's, that's religion. 
That's religion. A person who has religion goes to God and says, you're not helping me. You're not working for me. You're not healing me. That's religion because you're expecting God to do something on your command. That's not about, that's not about our walk with him in relationship. Relationship says, Lord, you're my father and there's a purpose for this. Whatever that purpose is, you're working it out. My suffering, my pain is doing something for my life so that I can learn to trust in you more, so I can receive your love more, so I can learn lessons, or so that I can glorify you through the sufferings in my life. That's a relationship, never turning your back on God. Job could have done that, but he didn't. He just trusted in the Lord. He knew that God had the power and not Satan, the Antichrist. Now, in the last days before the second coming of Christ comes where he will judge the earth. You can see this in Matthew 25. You can reference it later on. The Antichrist will rise up. I believe the Antichrist is here even now. And God is waiting for the right time to allow Satan to choose that Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. And I I don't like to theorize on who someone is. I mean, the latest thing, it's Obama. I remember when President Clinton was president, they said he was, he was the Antichrist, you know, and so now Putin's on the news all over, so he's got to be the Antichrist, and it's always someone that's in the news. You know, we don't know, and it's just a guessing game, and if anyone says that they know, they're wrong, you know. Um, it's nice to think about it. I mean, I've seen paper by people just written hundreds and hundreds of pages on how they figure out the Hebrews, the lettering, the numbering, and then they come up with a name, and aha, it's President Bush. He's the Antichrist, you know? And it's just like amazing how they put all these numbers together that you start getting confused. You're like, man, I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. You know, because you're pulling out scriptures here that mean numbers and letters in the Hebrew, and boy, I'm lost completely. You know, we don't know. I think that that when he shows up, it will be when the rapture takes place, somewhere right around there, maybe before, maybe a little bit before, or probably right after at those points. We may never see him, and we don't need to see him because we have the true Christ, and he's in our hearts, but God will judge that wicked one. Now, in, during this millennium reign, there's going to be a new ecology in the reign of the Messiah, uh, in that... Um, God is going to transform everything in the world. Now, Isaiah, as he goes through this, he, he's jumping from one place to another. I mean, it's hard to really, really grasp what he's saying. But so, so just reading and knowing the, the book of Revelation and some of the Old Testament and what's, what the children of Israel are going through at this time with Babylon conquering them, enslaving them, them losing the temple. It's totally destroyed in destruction, a, a heap, a pile, and so forth. Understanding all that, you can kind of see some of these things in here. So now he's talking about a future event during the millennium reign where he says the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf with the young lion, and the farling together, and a little child shall lead them. Can you picture that? I mean, it's just a beautiful little picture. How many of you ever wanted to, to lay down with a, a wolf? You know, you see some of these wolves on, on TV and it's, they're huge and they're furry. But can you imagine one being nice? You know, and being able to go up to it and just put your arms around it and hug it and say, oh, come on, let's go out and let's just enjoy ourselves. It's going to be an amazing time. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. They don't need food, meat, you know. Humans, they don't need that. The nursing child shall play with the uh, co- cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Then shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So uh, again, as as broad as the sea is in depth and height and so forth, um, the knowledge and everything will be known. Uh, John talks about that, right? We'll know all things as he knows all things when we get there. Uh, we We know partially right now, but when we get there, it will be awesome. I mean, a lot of times you, you hear pastors say, when I get there, I want to ask John the Baptist this question or Paul this question. But I think that when we get there, we're already going to know the answer. We don't have to ask any questions, you know. Um, it's going to be awesome. 
to be in the presence of the Lord. We'll probably be there for a couple of trillion years just worshiping him at his feet and, and being so in love with him, appreciative of, of what he has created for us in the future. So all this will take place during the millennium reign of Christ where the animals will no longer suffer from, the man, from man's rebellion against God. And that's the reason that animals attack us. It's the reason that animals attack each other. It's the reason that animals eat meat is because of the rebelliousness of man. The sin came into the world because of Adam and Eve, which then destroyed this earth. Now, the new exodus of the millennium reign of the Messiah in verse 10. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. Again, so he's talking future. The root of Jesse is Jesus, right? Who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now, Jesus came, what, for the Jews? But the Jews rejected him, so where did he go? To the Gentiles. And he said, I have other sheep that you're not aware of. You know, that's the Gentiles, and they will seek him. That's us, and so we seek him today. And yet the Jews don't seek him today, but he's working in that and that he'll regather the Jews together, and they will worship him. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand against the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros, Cush, Elam, and Shinar, from Hamath, and the islands of the sea. So there's going to come a time where, where Jesus will come again, and he will literally gather his people. Now go to Revelation chapter what? I think it's chapter 7 or so, 144,000 will become their witnesses. Uh, Jews will become the witness of Christ during the tribulation period. The Jews will be gathered again. When, when the Antichrist destroys, or the beast destroys uh, the two witnesses, Moses and whoever the other one is, uh, then the Jews are going to run to Petra, where God will then put their protection over them, and in a sense, regathering them together to uh, get them through like, the Noah's, like Noah's flood, when the world was flooded and God protected them in the ark, he's going to protect them in the rocks there in Petra uh, as his chosen people. But he set up a banner for the nations, verse 12, and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, or the four winds. Uh, again, further study is Matthew chapter 24. Uh, you can uh, read more about the, that scenario. Now the peace of the reign of the Messiah in verse 13. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. So he's going to bring about peace. Conflict will no longer be there. There will be peace among us. And that, wouldn't that be awesome to have peace? We always use that phrase. Can't we just get along? Yeah, we're going to get along. We're all going to get along, and we're going to know all things, and so there's no need to, to question things, the, to question the gray areas that we're not aware of, you know, but we're going to just trust in the Lord, and we're going to trust in one another, and we're just all going to get along. There's going to have peace. Judah will no longer have any quarrels whatsoever with um, Ephraim, or Ephraim will not harass Judah at all, so they'll be done. But they shall fly down upon the shoulders of the... Philistines towards the west, together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hands on Edom and Moab. People of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongues of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind, he shall shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shods. There, sh there will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. So we see some nations there that he will utterly destroy. So obviously Egypt is still around, but there's going to come a point where these nations will be uh, regathered together um, and then destroyed and gathering Israel together and taking them away. Uh, nothing can oppose the, the government of the Messiah. I mean, ultimately, in the end, Jesus will rule and reign all nations. And as the Bible says, every knee, every voice will confess that he is God. They're going to bow down to him. In chapter 12, we come to a chapter of praise uh, from the hearts who have surrendered themselves to the Lord. I, I, I love that because only hearts that are surrendered to the Lord can give true praise. There is a religious praise. 
a, a religious praise only says words. You know, they only say words. Um, I think about some some of the choirs that go on in the world today by the Mormons, Tabernacle Choir during Christmas time. I think of of some of the Catholic choirs that go on and and grandmas and and people, you know, get up there and sing the, the manger and so forth. Those are religious songs and praises because they're not from the heart nor are they they focused on the Lord in that they appreciate and love and, and adore him they're more from a religious aspect of works that we're doing this and you're accepting it it makes us feel better about ourselves it's it's focused on God and what he's done but it's not about that personal relationship it's about a religion it's about their works you know, we know that the Mormons work for their salvation. We know in Catholicism that you have to have certain works, sacraments and so forth in order to get to heaven. Or if some loved one passes away, you know, pray for them, please, because we want them to get to heaven because they're in purgatory. And if you work hard enough, then maybe God will let them into to heaven. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. And then you come to small little churches and people that just love the Lord, that are surrendered to the Lord, their hearts are surrendered, and just say, here I am, Lord, use me. I can't really sing. I don't know, you know how to even give you my heart, but here it is. And these are the ones that praise the Lord from the heart. These are the ones that, that God says uh, that the praises of my people, I encompass them. You know, I appreciate it. I, I just hover over them, and it's like he's sitting down, and he's listening, saying, ah, this is what I'm talking about. You know, this is my people praising me from the heart. So these are praises from the Lord. In that day, you will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Mm. Even though you were angry, you turned that anger around and you comforted me. You praised me. Now that's a good question. Does God get angry with us? Does God get angry with you? Is he an angry God? The anger and wrath of God against us was poured upon who? The Son of God. It was all poured upon Jesus Christ on the cross. His anger against sin, rebelliousness, transgressions, all poured upon the cross. So in a sense, no, God doesn't get angry with us. You know, again, religion will say God gets angry with me because I got to behave and I'm not behaving no, God doesn't get angry with you. He's already gotten angry on the cross. It's been taken care of there. It's been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, then what does he do? He corrects us. He chastens us because he loves us, just like a father. Do you get angry at your children that you want to just kick them out and say, don't ever come back? You don't know. You don't do You love your kids. So what do you do? You spank them, you know, on the bottom a little bit. And you tell them, don't do that. Why? Because you don't want to see them get hurt. You don't want to make have them make the wrong decision, the wrong choices, you know, and, and you're trying to do good for them, you know, and raising them up to be godly children. But you love them. You're not angry at them and say, don't ever come back again. I, I believe this girl who just tried to sue uh, her parents because uh, she left home at the age of 18. And so she was suing her parents for $600 a week. And I'm like, What? That's $600 a week. I, I was wondering if they could afford it uh, so that she could finish high school and then go on to college. And her lawyer said it was their responsibility to take care of their child that apparently she said they kicked her out. And that was not true. And so their defense was is their parents were harsh towards her. Do you know what the word harsh means? Well, to this young lady, harsh means don't tease your sister. That was one of the things that she was doing. Um, be home by 12. Be home by 12. And then there was one other thing was just as silly as that. And it's like, wow. If I had that when I was a teenager, I would have been on easy street, you know. <laughs> easy street. It's just amazing how kids are today. And I'm sure that those parents love her very much and are surprised <laughs> that she's doing something like this. Apparently, she told a neighbor and the neighbor's uh, a neighbor friend of hers, father was a lawyer, and so he took the case. And that's kind of sad. You know, I, I kind of wonder what's going on there. 
So God doesn't get angry with us. He loves us. He chastises us because he loves us just as the Father loves us. He goes on in this praise. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, the jo- or je- therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. It gives you that picture of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, right? The living water that can't be quenched. And in that day you will say, praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Um, this is a, a double fulfillment here. They will also exalt God in the future, right? We do it today. We exalt God. We praise God. They did it back then, and they will do it once again. And the Jews will do it once again when they finally meet Jesus Christ face to face. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. So praise song could learn from this praise song ourselves and how to praise the Lord when we gather together in song. He is worthy to be praised, what he's done. Okay, next chapter, 13. We have a prophecy of judgment against Babylon. Now, remember, Babylon has, by the will of God, come into Israel and has taken them into captivity. Then you've got the book of Daniel, which talks about the Babylonian kingdom and what was taking place there with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Babylon, interesting. Babylon started with the Tower of Babel, okay? The Tower of Babel. Now, it was both uh, eschological and it was also commercial. When, when you think of eschological, it's, it's more of a, a spiritual type of religious type of thing, Okay? So when you go back to the Tower of Babel, it was a religious type of thing. They were building their buildings high up in the sky. Why? Because they wanted to become like God. They wanted to reach the heavens. And yet at the same time, it was commercialized. They had everyone working together as a one world government. We kind of see that today. Babylon then we saw come into play again with Daniel taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm just giving you a quick little overview, a picture of what, it's, what it is. Uh, and then becoming a great nation, uh, a lot of religious artifacts and icons came out from that. Uh, Catholicism has taken some of the, uh, the, the wardrobe and things like that from Babylon and some of their customs and so forth, the, their idolatries. Then they were destroyed. And then today there has been an attempt to rebuild Babylon. And we saw that with um, Saddam Hussein who tried to rebuild Babylon, and there's a, there's a city there or a building, and it's vacant probably. There's not much there, but he tried to make it into that Babylon, a, a rebuilding of Babylon. And then you go to Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and you see Babylon again in those chapters. And I wish I had time, but maybe at another date, because there's all kinds of speculation. Now, who is Babylon? There is a eschatological Babylon. And yet there is a commercial Babylon. So it could be that they're speaking spiritually here. Whether it is a spiritual system that takes place during the tribulation period, because chapter 17 and 18 are during the tribulation period, okay? So remember that. A one world government, one world a religious system, a faith base like we have today. And so it could be that this faith base, is it run by Catholicism? Some say, okay, maybe Catholicism. We don't know. Is it the Muslims? It could be that they overtake. I don't know. You know, it, it's hard to say. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it because I don't know. It's good to theorize again and, and so forth and, and try to figure it out. But there is a spiritual Babylon. But then there's also commercial Babylon. And that will be the one world government run by the UN, run by United States. You know, I don't think the United States is in the picture, but but run by someone and there's going to be... a amount of wealth that will be taking place and God is going to judge Isaiah's Babylon that he's speaking about here in the near future and also the Babylon that's going to come in Revelation 17 and 18. So let's look at this burden against Babylon. The burden against Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. This army comes against it. Lift up a banner on high 
on the high mountain. Raise your voice to them. Wave your hands that they may enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. Those who rejoice in my exaltation. The noise of a multitude in the mountains like that of many people. Atonement this voice of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts musters the army of battle. Now, again, this is in the last part of the tribulation period. It could be that this is that battle of Armageddon. Now, there's another scenario, Armageddon, that great battle with the Lord. Now, there's two views there that I have read. One is that it takes place maybe before the rapture, or it takes place during that time when Christ comes at the second time. When he comes... And the nations are there in Megiddo, which is a vast area. I stood there and I looked out. It could hold a lot of armies there. And God comes and just him and the horse just wipes them all out. And the blood is all the way up to the bridle of the horse. It could be there. I think that's what it's talking about. But like we see in the book of Isaiah, double fulfillments. There could be a historical one taking place at a certain time and then it fulfilled during the tribulation. So it could be that we see these nations building up in these last days coming together you know, to fight maybe against Israel down there in Megiddo. You know, again, there, there's a lot of teaching about that. So just to give you an idea. But ultimately at the second coming of Christ, he will wipe them all out. Now, Isaiah finished his ministry about 685 B.C., a hundred years before Judah finally fell before the Babylonian Empire. So at the time of this prophecy, Babylon was a significant nation, but they were definitely behind the Assyrian Empire in the status. The Assyrian Empire and Babylon were competing against each other. One would become great, then the other would become great, and they kind of kept each other balanced, like, like the United States and Russia going back and forth, you know. Of course, we're the superpower, at least... Maybe we are, maybe we're not after all, you know, as we're getting closer to the end here. And yet we see that the Lord knows all things. Isn't that awesome that the Lord knows all things? He knows what the future brings. He knows what tomorrow brings. Why do we worry if God knows what tomorrow brings? Why do we get anxious? Why do we struggle with the future? Because we don't know what tomorrow brings because we're fearful of it. But when you trust in the Lord, when you know that he loves you and cares about you and that he's the author and finisher of your faith, you know, then you know that whatever tomorrow brings is in his will and that he's going to take care of you 100%. And so you don't have to worry. You can just trust in him and rejoice. God will take care of it. And, and I know I can say that, and yet tomorrow I'm going to say, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, because we're human you know, and we don't know the future but as soon as you say, Lord, what are you doing? Okay, I remember, you know everything, and you know what you're doing, and, and it's the best for me and for <coughs> the church here, Lord. And so it's good to know that somebody knows what's going on, you know? It's good to know that God knows, and that he's in control, and I'm not. Because there's some things that I would have probably done, and I'm glad God didn't let me do, because uh, it would have probably destroyed me, you know? And changed my life so verses 5 through 10 describe this great tribulation period again reference matthew 24 this punishment is against the iniquity of the evil world during the time and not of the church so remember that it's of the evil world at the time during the tribulation they come from a far country from the ends of heaven the lord and his weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land whale for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. The prophetic tense here, having in mind both a near future, the day of judgment there of the Babylonian Empire, but then ultimately fulfilled in the end times when the final day, as it says here, the day of the Lord is at hand. That's the day that we will be up there. You know, I don't know if we'll be watching. Or we'll be too busy rejoicing while we're up there. But that will be the day when the world will fear and tremble that the Lord is coming. My, my, um, my mom would, would discipline us, and oftentimes it wasn't enough. And so she would always say, 
wait till your dad comes home. Now, it didn't scare us because he came home at night while we were asleep. So we were asleep. And what is he going to do? <laughs> and so it didn't scare us until Saturday morning came because he didn't work. And then we realized, uh-oh, dad's home. <laughs> and we're going to be up and he's going to be up and we're in big trouble. And that's kind of like the church, isn't it? It's like, wait till the Lord comes. And we're just like, okay, he's coming. He's coming. But we, we think, well, let's wait till the last minute. And then, oh, now we got to get ready because he's going to be here. We can't think like that. We need to be ready all the time. Expect him coming now, tonight, this minute, this second, you know. Be ready for him. Because once my dad got up and mom told him everything, we got it. We got it. The wrath of my father came down on us, you know, and we got it good. So, so that's the day of judgment from the Lord. Therefore, all, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt. They will be afraid. Pangs and sorrow will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Um, I don't want to be here during that time. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. And I just went to a study on Tuesday, and it was a great study. He talked about the church today and how we're in trouble. And I just thought of that right now when he said that he will destroy its sinners from it. A lot of churches out there that aren't teaching about sin. And so people are unaware of this. That God's coming to destroy them because they're sinners. And no one's telling them that they're sinners and they need to repent and turn to God. He gave a list of all these churches this Tuesday and what some of the things that they're doing. Uh, there's, there are books that say, okay, you want a big church? Do not preach about sin. You know, two, do not convict them. Three, stay away from homosexuality. You know, and it just goes down like that. Uh, church growth, uh, there are pastors that are getting very descriptive that are trying to motivate people. So they're talking about motivating their couples, their, their marriages, and encouraging them. So they're challenging them. This is freaky. This is weird. The pastor's getting up there saying, look, I want your relationships to grow, so I want you to have sex for 30 days. I challenge you to do that. Me and my wife are going to do it, so you do it. And, I'm just, and they expect church growth because of that, because they're, they're freeing themselves up. I don't know, but this is the church growth patterns that are out there today. This is what they're thinking and it's crazy. And there are a lot of churches like that. And he went on with, with all kinds of, of other stuff. There's a church in Colorado. Church growth. The guy has a church of 16,000. It's not big enough for him. So he plants people within the seats. And, and when he calls for the altar call and baptism, these people stand up. I want to get baptized. And so then people start standing up. They're plants. And they encourage people to stand up. And they're baptizing 400 people. Most of those people, though, are plants to encourage others to stand up and to make it look like his church is growing and the Spirit's moving in a fresh way. And it's just a lie. You know? And he got busted for it. And his response was, I didn't know that was happening. If they were doing that, that was something that I was unaware of. You know, And so forth. So you're just seeing these churches that are fake. They're not real. They're not real. You know what churches are real? The real churches are the little ones that are struggling. Those are the real ones. How do you know that? Because they're struggling. And they're still going forward and pushing forward. You know, because they love the Lord and they have a call for the Lord. And they're not playing gimmicks and trying to do, you know, little uh, raffles and things like this that, that churches do. This Easter, you're going you're gonna to hear, you know, raffles, Easter egg hunts. You know, with tracks and little crosses inside. You know, why? Just stick with the truth. The truth will set you free, Jesus said. He will destroy its sinners from it. 
For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth. The moon will not cease or not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will, I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold. Wow. A man more than the gold wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Amazing. Amazing. The earth will literally be shaken out of its place. Right now, the earth is at, what, 23 degrees off its axis? And so that's the reason that we have our seasons, the, the winds and the time changes and so forth, because it's off the, the ice caps and so forth. They say, theory, that if the Lord shakes the earth back to where it's supposed to be, then we'll be dur living during the time of Adam and Eve, where everything will be green. Uh, there will be no ice. In fact, that's why when you go to Antarctic, you find plants deep down in the areas because it was during the time of Adam and Eve that the earth was not knocked off its axis. And when the flood came was probably when it caused the earth to knock off its axis, which makes kind of some sense because the water within the center of the earth or wherever that's all placed, you know, you move it, it changes position or place, it causes the earth to shift because there's no water in the other place. It's like a boat. A ship, you know, they put water right inside the boat itself to keep it down or to keep it high. If you put too much water on one side, you've got a willy or you got a low rider, you know, and you, do, 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 do. <laughs> you know, and so <laughs> low ride, never mind. So some, some believe that when God shifts that back over, you know, it's going to be like, you know, the garden again. And, and it could be during the millennium and that's what's happening. So everything is green. And everything is plush. And everything is just available. So awesome. It shall be as the hunted gazelle and as the sheep that no man takes up. Every man will turn to his own people and everyone will flee to his own land. Everyone who is found will be thrust through and everyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Their children also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives Ravish now, boy, 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 boy. If not for you, you know, if if not for you or for your friend, for their children, and for their wives, tell them they don't want to go through the tribulation period. You know, they need to accept Christ now. Babylon will laid waste. Look at verse seventeen. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them who will not regard silver. And as for gold, they will not delight in it. Now, this is a prophecy which will happen in the future because Babylon is a very small nation. It doesn't have the power at this time to destroy uh, Babylon. I'm sorry, the Medes are a small nation. It doesn't have the power to destroy Babylon. So he's thinking of the future. And you read this and you go, there's no way because the Medes are too small. But God is going to raise them up and they will destroy the Babylonians. Also their bows will dash the young men to pieces and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So utter destruction because of their moral de degradation. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabians pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there, but wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their horses will be full of owls, ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will uh, capper there, and hyenas will howl in their citadels and jackals in their pleasant places. Her time is near to come, and her day, her days will not be long. We come to chapter 14 as Babylon is destroyed again uh, because of this Babylonian destruction that means mercy towards Israel. He, again he's regathering. And then we see uh, Lucifer here too also. Uh, for the Lord, this is a famous chapter. This is where we see uh, Lucifer talked about. They're talking about the king of Babylon and his pride 
but it's also a reference to Lucifer and how he fell while he was in heaven. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of Jacob. So that restoration again. Then people will take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. They will take them captive whose captives they were and rule over their oppressors. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrows and from your fears and hard bondage in which you were made to serve that you will take up this proverb against the kingdom or the kings of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased. The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, who, he who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He who ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against them. So the end of all things in Israel will be restored again. And then we see this picture here. Hell from beneath is excited about you. That is scary <laughs> when you read that. Hell from beneath is excited about you, Babylon. Hell is, you almost picture the demons in the depths of the earth going, yeah, they're coming. We got them. Get ready, guys, you know. We're going to have some fun tonight as they all pour in here. You know, they're excited about Babylon coming down to the pits. That's the enemy. He's excited to see souls damned for eternity. That's why we need to continue to pray more for our lost ones. To meet you <clears throat> at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. They all shall speak and say to you, Have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp, pomp is brought down to Sheol or Hal, and the sound of your string instruments, the maggot, is spread under you, and worms cover you. That's scary. All the kings that have gone there, all the nations, have you become like us? We're waiting for you. The maggots are waiting for you. The worms are waiting for you. Oh. Then we find the five I wills. This is Lucifer. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. This is Lucifer. This is Satan, the great dragon, <clears throat> the morning star, the angel of light. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. He, he's at the core of the battles against the nations. He's running the scene there. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. This is the reason that, that he's doing it. I'm going to ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God or the angels of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the further side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet... You shall be brought down to hell, shallow, to the lowest depths of the pit. Anytime we put the word I, we're in trouble. Because the first, the second letter in sin is I. I, I, I. You know, I fall short of that sometimes. I want to do this. It's my work. Be careful. Be careful. I'm going to be. How many pastors think that that they're the answer for their church, that they have the way. How many pants, pastors are saying, I, you know, I have done this, I have done that. They haven't done anything. It's only by the grace of God. Be careful because that's pride. The pride of Satan, which caused destruction in his life, can also cause, be caused in our life. And in fact, that's religion, isn't it? Again, it's religion and not relationship. Relationship is trusting in the Lord not in our works. And we saw last week that if we're going to glory, let it be gloried in the Lord because it's the Lord that, you know, cuts down the trees. It's the Lord that takes the ax and swipes it, you know, across the stumps of the tree and so forth. It's the Lord's work, not ours. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, 
Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world as a wilderness and destroys its cities? Who did not open the house of his prisoners? Now when they see Satan, when we see Satan, we're going to look at him and go, that's you? That's what you look like? Now some have suggested that he's probably going to look like some nerdy little kid, you know, with glasses on and you're going to go, you're Satan? I thought you had a red tail and a pitchfork or ears and you looked ugly and big old muscles cut up. No, it's me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we're going to go, you're the guy? You're the one? You know? And that's what it's suggesting here that we'll be, we'll kind of be surprised. Really? <laughs> that's what you look like? And you think you're God? You know? It's a, it'll be a surprise to us. And he caused many to fall. Boy, the power of sin, right? Of pride and lust and all those things and what it can do to a man and blind him. All the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory. Every one in his own house, but you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, which is the opposite of the branch that comes out of Jesse, right? Like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. Now he's talking about the king there and what he has done. The brood of of evildoers shall never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers. Lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the earth with cities. For I will raise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and offspring of posterity, says the Lord. I will also make a possession for their porcupine, or no, porcu, yeah, porcupine, and marsh of muddy waters. I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, says the Lord. And then he changes kind of a little bit here and Talks about the Assyrians. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand, that I will break the Assyrians in my land and on my mountain, tread tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulders. So God definitely will have his plan fulfilled. This is the purpose that is purpose against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purpose and who will know it? His hand is stretched out and who will turn it back? Nobody. Then we see this new area where he kind of comes towards the Philistines or Philistri. This is the burden which came in the year that King Ahaz died. And so usually when you see that, phrase there, die, it's a, it's a new section. Do not rejoice, all you Philistra, because the root, the rod that struck you is broken, for out of the serpent root, serpent's roots will come forth a viper, and its offspring will be a fiery f- flying serpent. The firstborn of the poor will feed, and the needy will lie down in safety. I will kill your roots with the famine, and it will slay your remnant. Wail, O gates, cry, O city, all you Philistra are dissolved, for smoke will come from the north, and no one will be alone in his appointed time. What will they answer the messenger of the nations? That the Lord has founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall take refuge. <coughs> and we come to the last chapter, which is a short one. And he talks about Moab and his destruction. The burden of Moab, because in the night, air of Moab is laid waste and destroyed. Because in the night, care of Moab is laid waste and destroyed. He has gone up to the temple of Dibon, to the high places to weep. Moab will be will wail over Nebo and over Midaba. On all their heads will be baldness and every beard cut off, which is humility and mourning and weeping. In their streets, they will clothe themselves with sackcloth on the top of their houses. And in their streets, everyone will wail, weep bitterly. Hishbon, Elisha 
will cry out, their voices shall be heard as far as Zeb Jehaz. Therefore, the armies, soldiers of Moab will cry out, his life will be burdensome to him. My heart will cry out for Moab, his fugitives shall flee Zor like a three year old heifer. For by the ancestors of Luth, they will go up with weeping, for in the ways of Horonim, they will raise. Rise up a cry of destruction for the waters of Nimrim will be desolate for the green grass will wither away. The grass fails. There is nothing green. Therefore, the abundance they have gained and what they have laid up, they will carry away to the brook of the willows. For the cry has gone all around the borders of Moab. It's wailing in Iglam and it's wailing in Beer Elim for the waters of Demon will be full of blood because I will bring more upon Dion, lions upon him who escapes from Moab and on the remnant of this land. So the destruction of Moab, again, God's going to destroy all the nations. Moab was that firstborn son in that incestuous relationship between Lot. You remember when his daughters got him drunk and they had a, a child there and then the Moabs came out of that area there. Uh, they're in modern day Jordan today, which would be on the, uh, I think, the east side of the Dead Sea there where Jordan is at. And so once again, even Jordan will be destroyed in the end times. 